Night Blossoms, written by Delio Pera, read by Delio Pera. Soil, rich with squirming life, shuddered as a barbed tendril lanced through a mole and drained the rodent of life, turning it to a husk of fur and cracked bone in the blink of an eye. Throughout the dirt, Worms and roots became black and desiccated where the barbed feeler passed in search of sustenance. The tendril was one of hundreds, originating from a singular mass buried deep in the farmland, a hundred miles from the nearest hive city. When enough life was gathered, a section of the mass broke off to begin the process of growing, gathering, then separating to restart the cycle. Slow at first, ever so slow. The most insidious sicknesses are those that hide until it's much too late. A single mine touched by darkness was the first seed to be planted. One twisted mind was all it took to destroy a world. He walked from the hive city and lay in a field of crops where his body was eaten from the inside out. Cells that once held the code to maintain his human form were twisted, broken, and changed. His skin slewed off, his bones turned to mush, his muscle and blood became so much liquid. The pool that had once been a man congealed into hundreds of leech-like creatures burrowing into the ground. Death was left in their wake, and as the world died, they grew. Dark, Patches of ground spread across the farmland. The only ones that might have seen the spreading death were the blind farming servitors. Programmed only to harvest and replant, they were incapable of seeing the earth wither. As the land above died, the masses below grew. In search of greater sources of food, the biomasses began writhing their way towards the hive city. The city pulsated with life. Millions of forms and beings all unaware of what was soon to befall them. The biomass feelers worked their way into the underhive's sewers where rats and fish and gangers were the first to be eaten. A single leech attached itself to the belly of a rat, feeding on the corpse of an infant discarded by a mother too poor to care for it. The rat spasmed as the leech chewed into its belly. As the rat's genetic code was rewritten, it shed its fur and its skin hardened to a density that rivaled plasteel. The creature opened its mouth three times wider than it ever had in its previous life. Four rows of razor-sharp teeth glistened in the light of flickering lumens. Another transformation took place in the putrid waters. Fish became aquatic harbingers of sickening change. Their scales were reformed into projectiles and shot into fishermen wearing tattered clothing. The men's eyes bulged from lack of light in the sewers and their skin was thin enough to see veins. An old-timer pulled a recent catch up and scowled at the sight of the thing he'd caught in the dark depths. Strange fish were common in the underhive. New mutations seemed to crop up every couple of weeks. But the thing he'd reeled in was unlike anything he'd ever seen before. Before he could call a friend over to look at the bizarre, chittering thing, his face was shot full of jagged scales. An instant after the scales sunk into his face, they began to flutter. At the same time, their spined edges worked in such a motion that they were driven deeper into his face. The horrible little creature followed new senses. Able to feel heat and mass, the rat skittered through rusted pipes, up a line of electrical conduit, through a grate, and into a room full of gangers. The rat thing launched itself into the first human it crossed and dug its rows of teeth into the woman's ankle. She howled and kicked to dislodge the creature, but it was no use. Unable to rid herself of the foul thing, she shot it, point blank with her shotgun, but her blood had already begun to change and her eyes melted in their sockets. Her teeth fell from her mouth and the muscles of her jaw swelled with rapid growth. Before her fellow gangers knew what to do, her body burst. As sewers fish, rats, fishermen, and gangers succumbed to mutation, 
the underhive became a place of death. Nothing survived the invasion. Boils grew and popped on the backs of every aforementioned creature, filling the air with spores pregnant with the genes that would bring about horrid change. As the army of foul creatures hunted the sewers in search of more food, the spores rode drafts of warm air into the city above. Where even a single speck landed, mutation began. A hunched back man, on his way home from a factorum, noticed purple and black spreading over the back of his hand. As he stepped under a street lumen for a better look, he heard a scream. Then another. He cried out in pain as his hand began to twist and crumple in on itself. His fingers balled into his palm and the bones broke as muscles and skin tore. His forearm swelled and melted into his torso. A moment later, he was cleaved in two by a creature with scything claws as long as he was tall. Each half of the hunchback grew its own eyes, claws, and mouth, then scuttled away to continue the feeding. The sounds of the city's endless industry were replaced by explosions, screams, and bodies, small and large, deforming in a myriad of ways. The city's defense forces were called, but the invasion was too far underway. The city was breathing its last, even as it began to realize what was happening. That was Night Blossoms, written by Delio Pera, and read by Delio Pera. That was my second attempt at a Tyranid story, with the theme, Everyone Can See It. The idea here being it's kind of a loose, it wasn't real great connection to the theme of everyone can see it. It's everyone can see that the city's going away and everybody's a part of this mutation that's happening. Again, writing a story with the Tyranids or the Tyranid thing, just the biomass that is called the Tyranid swarm, is really difficult. That was kind of a drawn out prologue if anything to set a scene and it, it doesn't feel like much of a story because it's not one it's there's not real it's it, it's really difficult and maybe it's impossible i'm not going to say it's impossible i think it might be impossible for me with where i'm at and my skill as a writer to write a compelling, interesting story with the Tyranids as the focal point, as the protagonist. Um, I think they're a great antagonist. It's just this thoughtless problem that has to be dealt with. But to try and make that the thing that you give a damn about you, the listener, the reader, uh, the audience, it's it's difficult. There's There's no way to identify with it you might be able to identify certain parts of yourself as a human, certain aspects of yourself, but it's like trying to, I've said this before, write a story about the personification of, of anger, but not even really giving it a personality because a personality suggests the idea of, of variation. And there's no real variation with the Tyranids. It's just consume. That's that's uh, destroy, get bigger. It's uh, it's it's a virus. It's like trying to. I mean, how do you? How would you write a story about COVID nineteen? It just it, it doesn't. It's not a thinking thing. Certainly not in the same way that you or I thinks of, uh, about things. Think about things. If I think, oh, okay, you know, I I'm, I got to get up and I've got to have some breakfast. Okay, what 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 kind of breakfast do I want? The Tyranids don't do that. It's just eat eat, eat, destroy, consume, take over. And uh, so I, I, I took two stabs at it and could it, could, have, could it have been worse? Absolutely. Could it have been better? S again, certainly. Um, but from me, I, I, I don't think so. I think that's about as good as I could do. I've seen somebody other, uh, 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 some other people take a stab at writing at at the the Tyranids, and what I've seen isn't accurate from how I imagine Tyranids. Um, the one that I'm thinking of, I'm not going to say what it is because uh, I don't really want to bash it or anything. 
had names of the Tyranids, and I just don't think that that's accurate. May, I don't know enough about Tyranid lore, so maybe it's totally accurate. Maybe my interpretation is, is totally wrong. I haven't done a whole lot of research on them. But from what I gather, they're not calling each other names and, and hey, Bob, do you want to go out there and kill some people today? Well, Jim, I sure do. Uh, you know, I was thinking about growing some wings here and so I could fly around the city a little bit better. What do you think? Well, I was thinking about, uh, you know, mutating into the form of a of, of a of more of a burrowing thing so I could go and get at the stuff that's under the ground. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, maybe I'll try that next time. I don't I don't think it's like that. I actually I I bet two dollars that it's not like that. That's right, folks. You heard it here first. A whole two dollars. So point being, I don't know that you can really do a Tyranid story properly, at least not in the same way that you would write about a person going about their day or wanting to achieve something, you know, writing about Harry Potter, going to become a wizard and going to school, Hogwarts to do that isn't the same as a Tyranid swarm invading a planetary system and, and, and just eviscerating it of all life. It, it's, it, it's not the same. It's not even close. All right, I hope you enjoyed these last couple stabs at this. If you have advice or have some pointers on how I could do it better or um, w w how my interpretation of the Tyranids are wrong or correct, let me know. Thanks for listening. Bye.